So greetings. Um, we welcome you to this PERN's second webinar, which is kicking off PERN's 22nd Cyber Seminar. This one on the topic of People and Pixels Revisited, 20 Years of Progress and New Tools for Population Environment Research. My name is Alex DeSherbinen, and I serve as a co-coordinator of the Population Environment Research Network, or PERN for short, and I'm joined here by the other PERN co-coordinator, Susanna Adamo, and Senior Network Assistant Lisa Lukang at Columbia University, where we work at uh, Season. For those of you who are not familiar with PERN, the network is established in 2001 as a project of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, or IUSSP, in the International Human Dimensions Program, or IHDP, a program that was later merged into Future Earth. PERN is currently a scientific panel of IUSSP and is a sustained partner of Future Earth, a global research platform to accelerate our transformations to a sustainable world. The network currently has more than 2,300 members around the world. PERN receives in-kind support from the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center which is managed by the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, or CSEN, at Columbia University. Today's webinar serves as a kickoff to the Cyber Seminar, and I'm very pleased to introduce David Rathal, who will be the moderator today of our webinar. He is an assistant professor of geography at the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. David does research in remote sensing, geomorphology, and geoinformatics, and is also expert in the use of mobile phone data for research on population mobility, including climate change, displacement, and migration. More recently, he has used remote sensing data to study land transformations due to money laundering from narco-trafficking in Central America. David is a member of PERN's steering committee and is no stranger to the cyber seminar format, having moderated an October 2013 cyber seminar on climate change, loss, and damage. So today, David will moderate the webinar, and we will be joined by several of the panelists who we will be hearing from over the coming week. Let me remind webinar participants of a few things. So David, if you could proceed to slide two. When you join the webinar, you will be muted uh, automatically, but if you unmute, for instance, one of our panelists who may uh, present their slides, please remute yourself after you finish presenting so that we can reduce the amount of background noise. If you have a question, please post it to the chat box to everyone or to every, all with reference to the specific presenter and topic so that we can be sure to have the right person answer your question. The Cyber Seminar takes place from today until next week, the 27th of February. If you wish to join the Cyber Seminar, just email the email address that appears on your screen, and you will be subscribed to the discussion list. Anyone is welcome to post questions or interact with the panelists on the discussion list. So with that, that I will uh, pass the baton to David Rathel, who will uh, introduce the theme of the seminar. Thank you, David. Thank you, Alex, and thanks to Susanna Adamo and other folks at Season um, the and the Population Environment Research Network. Uh, thanks to the panelists for joining us uh, today, uh, this morning, this evening, wherever they are. And of course, thanks to the PERN community for tuning in today. Um, I'm David, a member of the PERN Steering Committee and a geographer at Oregon State. And as Alex said, my research concerns are to do with forced migration, um, especially when climate change is the driver. And as many of the population environment research community, um, in searching for better research designs, data, and methods in order to resolve the key questions that I saw in the field, I found myself inadvertently um, stepping into the second generation of people and pixels research, as many as, of, of us have inadvertently. Um, and so this year, we marked 20 years since the publication of the original um, uh, book, People and Pixels. And we're taking the opportunity to to reflect on advances, take stock of where we've come, and look ahead to the next 20 years. Um, so we've arranged a, a very compelling panel of folks who represent progress, um, whose work has really unlocked key advances um, in, in the questions that concern us. Um, so looking forward to coming decades, what can we expect? 
So the themes that we'll cover this week involve the core concerns of people and pixels, um, socializing the pixel, the efforts to add social insight to the global time series data that have been made available by satellite imagery, and then on the other side, um, pixelizing the social or spatializing the, the conventional social data that are available through censuses and uh, representative surveys, et cetera, um, to understand landscapes. So this, this people and pixels move and geography has really shed light on some of the key concerns of sustainability, human livelihoods, land use change and land use planning, resource use, conservation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we're, we're really concerned with how these topics may continue to advance. Um, so just very quickly, um, the themes that we'll reflect on this week include um, ways of combining satellite imagery and nationally representative um, uh, household survey at very large scales, uh, national scales, even uh, global scales. Um, we're interested in shedding light on the background environmental processes through the so-called big data, the use of new data streams um, from portable digital devices and the digital infrastructure, uh, and, and what this may mean for um, population downscaling and poverty mapping and other such applications. Uh, one key advance has been the development of data products on landscape patterns such as human settlement, forest change, uh, surface water. These um, breakthroughs in, in remotely sensed uh, products have, have unlocked a, a set of, of methods for global analysis and um, that, that, have, that continue to advance through time. Of course, in the last 20 years, we've seen large advances in, in our ability, uh, in, our, in our computational abilities and the graphical um, user interfaces that allow us to implement things like machine learning, deep learning, pattern recognition, anomaly detection, um, and uh, unsupervised mapping. Um, so finally, um, we look forward to greater synthesis between the landscape pattern and processes that we see uh, from remotely sensed data and also social data. So um, the way that we can understand um, high impact hypotheses around disasters, land grabbing, violent conflict, famine, um, illicit economies um, through their signature in the landscape. So we'll, we'll reflect on some of these key questions as the week unfolds. So this is the, the, the list of our panelists who joined us today. Um, First, we're going to hear from Emilio Moran. He's not with us um, uh, in person, but he will reflect some of his remarks that he prepared for us. He's one of the original authors of, of People in Pixels, and he's going to set the stage um, for uh, discuss the origins of People in Pixels and, and, and chart, uh, chart through the present. Um, Alex Desherbanen and Susanna Adamo uh, from CSUN. Um, at Columbia University are going to explain how environmental data are created and made available using an example of two data services, NASA's Giovanni and Appears. Next we'll hear from um, Andrea Galgan from the University of Louisville, um, providing a basis for understanding what uh, pixelizing the social means in gridded population data. Tracy Kugler from um, IPOMS, the Integrated Public Use Microdata series and the University of Minnesota is going to explain efforts to pixelize national, national social and economic data, census data, and other micro-level household data, um, which has been done at IPOMS Terra. Ryan Engstrom at George Washington University will explain poverty mapping, um, estimating levels of development among populations about whom we know the least due to the difficulty of, of gathering information on these folks. Um, using conventional data collection techniques like, like censuses. Catherine Grace from the University of Minnesota is going to reflect on the sig significance of pixelizing the social for health research, what we can learn about uh, public health challenges and some of the difficulties of, of integrating uh, remotely sensed data and nationally representative health data because of, of data sensitivity issues. The four presentations that follow can be characterized as a characterizes advances in socializing the pixel. Um, Guido Cervone and Carolyn uh, Holtquist from Pennsylvania State University are going to discuss recent turns in the use of citizen science, crowdsourced data, social media data, and other um, data from the digital infrastructure to better understand disasters. Um, Jamin Vandenhoek from Oregon State University will explain advances in our understanding of violent conflict um, 
from spatial changes in spatial patterns and processes in the landscape. Beth Tillman from Arizona State University is going to discuss um, a turn in land system science to measure how political and economic forces that are very difficult to observe, often intentionally obscured, can change the landscape um, and using the case of, of narco trafficking in Central America. And then finally we'll hear from um, Doug Comer from Cultural Site Research Management to, uh, to explain what remote sensing can contribute to archaeology. And finally, Chris, Christoph Albrecht from the European Space Agency and a representative of the World Bank will reflect on the state of the field, um, what knowledge gaps exist, and how uh, knowledge gaps and research questions have led to led sensor development in recent years, and where this may lead us in the future. Um, so without any further remarks, I'll um, turn it over to Alex, who will reflect uh, some words that Emilio Moran prepared for us. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you, David. Um, and if you could just mute yourself, thank you. Um, so we um, uh, invited Emilio last um, summer, actually, to present at the American Geophysical Union uh, conference in the fall, and he graciously accepted our invitation. And uh, Emilio uh, is a professor of anthropology at Michigan State University and uh, has worked with us at season over the years. Uh, and in fact, I was an attender of his SIPEC, which is uh, organized at University of uh, Indiana University uh, back in 2000. So I'm dating myself now, but that was uh, part of um, the response to people in pixels. So next slide. Um, so a little history. Um, there was a recognition in the 1990s that there was, um, you know, a, a mutual need to dialogue between the remote sensing community and the social science community in the early 90s. And uh, basically the social sciences wanted to expand their spatial coverage and spatial explicitness of the context. And for the remote sensing community, they wanted to look both at social utility, so kind of uh, what we call now societal benefit areas and areas where remote sensing could be applied to solve real-world problems, but also they were interested in looking at the landscape in new ways, so-called socializing the pixels. Uh, next slide. A challenge of uh, these, the real challenge was integrating methods and theories. So the volume of people in pixels was mostly devoted to examples of uses of remote sensing by the pioneers in social science applications across a number of areas. Anthropology, a lot of work on deforestation, for instance, in the Amazon, uh, forest cover change and social patterns of migration in, in Nanrong and in, in Thailand, other groups working on famine early warning systems or health applications, um, and uh, urbanization was another theme. Uh, they wanted to focus um, on what, you know, worked in this area, what didn't, um, what kind of new uh, funding might be needed and new in, uh, initiatives may be required in order to uh, basically do um, to kind of support the work that people in pixels engendered. And so this was led by Diana Liverman and of course Emilio and Ron Rinfis were early committee members. Next slide. NASA had an agenda as well which was to increase uh, and expand the number of remote sensing data users. Re recalling that at the time Landsat data was $4,000 a scene. No kidding. Someone's unmuted if you could just check mute people as echoes occur. Um, David, I think, just mute him. So the um, one question is, what can remote sensing do for social sciences? David, could you make it full screen again? Um, it can give richer detail of the biophysical context within which people live. It gives time series data with greater frequency than the decadal censuses were available, uh, which are still available largely for social science research. It measures the effects of decisions uh, by households, for instance, on things like deforestation, land use choices, and tillage practices. And it measures more easily collect, um, uh, collected in time and space and comparisons across regions, uh, regions are more feasible. It also provides multi-level analysis. You can look at larger regions and you can look at villages and then you can actually look at individual farm plots. Next slide. 
So what can social science do for remote sensing? It provides a new source of validation and interpretation of remote sensing observations. In other words, it kind of puts a, a face, a human face, on the pixel. It enhances what is meant by ground truthing, and it raises early uh, concerns about confidentiality and public use of remote sensing observations. So social scientists were really the first to begin asking questions about um, maintaining the confidentiality of research subjects in regards to remote sensing, especially as a new higher resolution satellite sensors were launched in the early part of uh, the 2000s. And then it provided new techniques for data aggregation, removal of geo-identifiers, and new methodological approaches for, for working in uh, the combination of remote sensing and uh, socioeconomic data. Next slide. So um, some of the issues that were foreseen 20 years ago included finding the right scale of analysis. Um, these are important issues in the introduction to people and pixels and several of the chapters in that volume. Uh, there was a need to build a community of people who were working um, in some new training of future scholars, including programs like SciPEC that I mentioned early in the presentation, uh, where uh, tools such as GIS and remote sensing were introduced to social science researchers, uh, and it provided the necessary data, data at a reasonable cost. Um, at the time, uh, though Landsat scenes were sold for um, $4,000, uh, you had to pay that amount to get a Landsat scene. There was actually an open market for scenes once they were purchased. So you could actually put them on a server at the University of Maryland. Next slide to uh, allow people to share data. Of course, now we know that uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years there's been uh, 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 an ever-growing um, volume of data available for free on the web. And of course, Landsat, the whole Landsat archive is now free of charge. Um, so there have also been advances in the last 20 years, including several volumes that came after P People in Pixels, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but you can read the list yourself and see the number of journals, special issues, and in fact there's even a 20th anniversary People in Pixels issue that one of our particip participants, Catherine Grace, and another Deborah Balk, uh, who is formerly at Season, are organizing on the Population Environment uh, Journal. Next. Next slide, please. Next slide, David. Thank you. Um, so one thing that's happened also in recent years, uh, go back, is that there's been an uh, abundance of open free data um, and uh, higher resolution thematic data. CDAC, in fact, uh, the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, serves as one source of data that are complementary to remote sensing. We've done some of the hard work for you by pixelizing the social, as it were, by putting people in pixels, and I think Andrea Gahn will give more on that uh, in a moment. Uh, and then there's one issue, though, there seems to be a decreased investment on the part of social science is to get training to carry out remote sensing as part of the data processing process. Um, Google Earth and Engine has opened up new possibilities for using remote sensing at every stage of research, from research design to ground truthing and using online high-resolution images. So not only Google Earth, but the Earth Engine platform has really opened up things quite a bit. Next slide. Um, so what might we expect in the next 20 years? Uh, using big data algorithms, linking social media, we're already going to be talking about that today uh, through some of the presentations, more affordable access, um, and uh, of course there's the big data and the informatics and kind of machine learning world that's growing around these remote sensing in conjunction with other data sets. Uh, civil society demanding more results, so we're going to probably see uh, um, uh, continued demand on the part of uh, uh, society to see that remote sensing and social data be put to um, good use for solving real-world problems. Um, we may even see remote sensing taught in, and also GIS at the high school level alongside programming and coding skills. So, um, of course, Emilio somewhat wistfully says that we may also forget that people's in pixels in 1998 represented a huge leap forward. So, next slide, please, David. 
So the next part of the presentation is uh, by Susanna Adamo and myself, and it's basically focusing on two tools which uh, are useful for uh, social science researchers, and we just really want to introduce social scientists who may be on this call and through the webinar um, to these two tools. So next slide. Uh, one is called Giovanni, uh, which was started in uh, 2002, so it's been around for an awful long time, but very few remote uh, social scientists that I know of actually know that it exists. One of the reasons these tools are so useful is it eliminates a lot of the labor-intensive muss and fuss that was traditionally associated with processing remote sensing data. Um, example applications include things like tiling, a uh, subset of tiled remote sensing data or process parameters. So you can kind of select your area for study, whether it's a, a larger a city or a neighborhood or a, a whole continent, and basically get that kind of pre-tiled and pre-processed for your study. And it includes not only kind of the raw data, but also a number of parameters such as NDVI, particulate matter 2.5, land surface temperature, et cetera. You can extract time series values for over an area or for more one or more pixels. The, ta the table below is going to be in the, in the concept note that we're distributing online, so you can study that more at your leisure. But basically, Giovanni has some, is focused more on the atmospheric research community. It tends to have lower spatial resolution but higher temporal resolution. There are a number of ways you can extract information and get time series analysis from Giovanni that has tremendous image, um, data visualization capabilities. Um, Appears is a more recent tool that's been developed by the LPDAC at uh, USGS and, uh, sorry, LPDAC, which is a NASA distributed active archive center, and it's based in Sioux Falls at one of the major USGS headquarters uh, in Sioux Falls. Um, next slide. So Giovanni, I think, is the first uh, tool that I've included here. And this is kind of the, the user, the dashboard that you get when you enter Giovanni. And basically, it allows you to filter the different remote sensing parameters that you may be interested in, whether it's land surface temperature or the, the temperature at two meters elevation for the United States. Um, you can filter by particulate matter or other parameters that may be of interest. And I've listed a number of parameters that could be of interest to remote sensing scientists or public health practitioner, uh, researchers on the left-hand side. Next slide. And then, you know, this is an example of the kinds of outputs that you can get. Um, so this is animated. Um, the first animation shows rainfall over Texas, for instance. Um, and then next... Um, during the Hurricane Harvey event in August 2017, and the next is that same rainfall over the same bounding box, um, but um, basically showing it area averaged over that bounding box. Uh, next slide. There's a slight delay. Um, there we go. So Appears is a tool that was developed, as I said, by the Land Processes DAC. Um, it has a number of parameters that are very much of interest to social scientists, including data from aqua modus, land cover data from modus, population counts and densities from our own gridded population of the world, uh, shuttle radar topography mission elevation data, and then vegetation indices. So next. Um, what you see in the left-hand corner is uh, kind of the dashboard and some points. Uh, they're actually points that are aggregated, so each of those points represents a cluster of, say, 10 or 20 points that Susanna Adamo put into appears. These were from a research area that she's very interested in, Argentina. And one of the things that would might be of interest to a social science researcher is to look at these points, which were identified as settlement points by the Argentinian system. system. And basically, there are different categories of settlements. And one might want to look to see over time whether the land cover in that particular point has changed, say, from being vegetated to built up or what have you. So that's just a simple use case. But one of the beauties of Appears is, um, and this distinguishes it somewhat from Giovanni, is that you can put in literally thousands of points if you want and get time series values for the different remote sensing parameters that you might be interested in. So you can think as a social scientist of probably hundreds of use cases just based on that, knowing what kind of data are in there. 
So I will stop there and I think we'll go on to the next presenter. Thank you, David. Okay, I guess that's me. Uh, my name is Andrea Gaughan. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Louisville and I'm going to present an overview of an uh, opinion piece that represents myself and Catherine Lennard, who is at the University of Namur in Belgium, uh, but also includes some thoughts from two of our other colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrew Tatum at the University of Southampton uh, and Dr. Flora Stevens, who's also here at the University of Louisville. Uh, next slide, please. So this, this slide here is basically just giving an overview of uh, how we take information, population data, uh, and grid it. And so when I, I probably should have just prefaced this by saying thank you for the invitation to be a part of this because I was very excited um, to receive the invitation and to think about just the, the involvement and the progression of how we as um, people, I, come, I, my, I associate with a land change background uh, and remote sensing and the way that we use remote sensing and apply it to human environment uh, research questions has just had a, a, a tremendous trajectory in terms of that rapid pace of technological uh, development and the types of tools uh, and the types of data that we have available for asking these kinds of questions. And, when we think about socializing the pixel, gridded population data sets is literally putting people in those pixels. And so this, this uh, slide here represents taking census information on the left-hand side and using it to disaggregate into, uh, in this case, 100 meter grid cells uh, representing a, a spatial denominator, spatial human denominator for use in subsequent types of analyses. Uh, and the research community that is involved in this type of, of work has seen a huge sort of push in terms of the, the research agenda for how to produce these kind of data sets, what kind of information remotely sensed derived combined with other types of um, spatially explicit uh, types of data for informing this, this, this process. Um, and and just to give you uh, an example in terms of context, uh, some key advancements in the, in the area of public health has resulted from this gridded population process. So 20 years ago, you might have been using remote sensing to map out health risks, uh, but now it's the integrating this human factor is um, much more common. Using the spatial distribution of populations, the demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, looking at their connectivity, they all have very relevant and impactful um, uh, information tied to disease dynamics. The gridded population data sets also um, are particularly useful in measuring progress towards international health and development goals, uh, identifying and making plans with regards to the dissemination of vaccinations, uh, and being able to estimate populations at risk, whether it's related to infectious disease burden or maybe climate uh, change or some other type of uh, phenomenon on the ground. And so the advances uh, in modeling human population, there, there's, a, there's a wide gamut in terms of the way, the, the methods that underlie the way these different data sets get produced. And there's multiple types of uh, data sets that are publicly available. Some of these um, in, uh, incorporate a large range of ancillary data set. The example again on this slide uh, actually represents one of those more complex types of statistical approaches that relies on a suite of ancillary data. Uh, a lot of that uh, remote sensing derived to inform that disaggregation approach. Um, other, other approaches like the gridded population um, of the world that, that Alex mentioned actually just relies on the census data in terms of just dis distributing the total counts of those census units into grid cells. Uh, and so if you can imagine the, the spatial grain of a, of a census unit, how fine scale that census data is, uh, you can think about how accurate that type of disaggregation approach might be. Uh, and next, next slide, please. Sorry for the background noise. We University of Louisville has the pleasure of being just over the flight the flight path for the um, for the airport, and we have we have trains. 
So, uh, right, so greater population um, data sets. In that research community, we think about that top-down approach and using census data and disaggregating that census data based off a suite of ancillary data sources. Um, but there are alternatives to the to what we consider that top-down approach. And so there's a lot of other types of data that's out there that are currently being utilized in this population community, research community, to, to, to complement that traditional um, census data uh, with regards to understanding the, the distribution and the, the movement of population across space and across time. Uh, and all of these different kinds of data sources have their own pros and cons associated with them, uh, bias through measurements at smaller sample scales, such as geolocated household survey data, uh, specific demographic groups that are captured through, say, um, social media threads like Twitter, uh, or just simply factors related to population densities in terms of thinking about the underlying satellite imagery. And so it still comes back to this question that, that uh, with those predominant uh, resolutions of trade-offs between spatial and temporal grain uh, and extent related to the research question of interest as to the most appropriate type of data um, to use for a given given initiative. Uh, and some of the some of the questions that are still outstanding in terms of thinking about uncertainties and considerations of these different data sources. Uh, what is the quality? How recent? What is the granularity of the census data being used to produce the, the population maps? What's the accuracy of any ancillary data sources used in producing these maps? Um, and is it contemporaneous with the scale of interest? Uh, the progression of gridding population data has been evolving very quickly and in parallel with a lot of the advancements with being able to um, map out at finer finer grains spatially uh, and even temporally uh, information about settlement uh, data across the across, and other types of land cover across the globe. But maybe one of the greatest challenges we still face with regards to these population uh, data sets is uh, an appropriate means for validating the data. Uh, and so if you think about it in terms of the nature of the source of the data, which is the census unit with the top-down modeling approach, and trying to uh, disaggregate that to a target, i.e. the pixel, uh, it's difficult to have reliable, accurate, accurate validation data to assess model fit. And when you start scaling that up to regional and global scales, it becomes even more challenging. Uh, but the spatial reasoning and the importance of space and time for linking environmental changes to the distribution, movement, and concentration of human population um, is implicit to tying the why to the where. Uh, and that multiscalar perspective in all good um, ways of thinking about human environment interaction uh, remains important and vital to, to that type of research. Uh, and so I'm happy to address any questions here or um, the day that, the, the, I think it's tomorrow, that this particular part of the cyber seminar will be live. Thank you. Hey, hi. Uh, I am Trace Googler and I am with IPOMS at the University of Minnesota. And IPOMS, uh, broadly speaking, provides census and survey data integrated across place and time uh, across the world. We have a series of data products. Generally, each one covers a particular survey or type of survey. Um, so we have international microdata products, we have US microdata and aggregate data products, we have health surveys, a wide variety of things. Um, I'll be focusing for the purposes of this webinar and cyber seminar on IPOMS Terra, which integrates population and environmental data. Next slide. So as I mentioned, IPMS Terra includes both the people and the pixels. And I'll give you kind of a brief rundown of what's in our data collection. So we have microdata, which are individual person-level records from a census or a survey. So each record gives you 
all of the responses to all of the questions that were asked on that census for a particular person. And those are organized in terms of households so that you can do very detailed individual or household level analyses of what characteristics seem to influence each other at that level. We also have area level data, which is kind of the maybe more familiar um, from a published census table. So those are at the level of administrative units, and you'll get for each unit typically a count of people in that unit that meet a particular characteristic or a combination of characteristics. On the pixels or in the environmental side, oh, go back, thank you. <laughs> Um, we have data on land cover. We have a couple of different classified land cover products. On land use, we have data from the Global Landscapes Initiative, also here at the University of Minnesota, um, which covers harvested area and yield for individual crops. So everything from the more common wheat, corn, maize, rice, all the way down to things like blueberries and avocados and almonds. On the climate side of things, we have both long-term averages from the WorldClim data set, 1950 to 2000, single average over that time frame. And then we also have the Climate Reference Unit time series, which is monthly data from 1900 to, we have 2013 in our data set. Now the next slide, please. So IPM's Terra uses location-based integration to transform data across these three different data structures. And the idea is that we're trying to kind of democratize the access to data from the domains that, and I don't know if this is on auto advance, if we can slow this down a little bit, that'd be great. Um, so the idea is that microdata, in particular, and raster data tend to be used within particular scientific domains. So sociologists and economists tend to be very familiar with microdata. Environmental scientists tend to be more familiar with raster data. And by doing this integration and this transformation in a more automated fashion so that people, individual researchers, don't have to get into the details of it. Um, the idea is to enable sociologists, economists, other social scientists to more easily use raster data or environmental scientists to get access to the flexibility and the power of microdata. So within IPM's Terra, we do these transformations across these three data structures. So if we can go to the next animation. So we can take microdata, the individual person level records, and tabulate that to create area level data at the level of administrative units. So counting all of the women between the ages of 15 and 30 who have a college education or something along those lines for each administrative unit. We can do a similar thing where we can take raster data and summarize it to area level data. So we can take all of the pixels that fall within an administrative unit and summarize them, take an average over those pixels to get a summary for the administrative unit, maybe in terms of average annual temperature or percent of that unit that is in a particular land cover class. Next. We can also go towards microdata by attaching characteristics to the microdata. So we can take area level data, which contains uh, kind of the socioeconomic context in which those individuals are located and attach it to those individual person level records. So we could get, for each person level record, we could get, for example, the percent unemployment in the census unit in which they live. We can do a similar thing with the summarized raster data that we've created area level data. We can attach that to microdata as well. Um, and then next, and going kind of the other direction, we can take area level data um, and rasterize it. So we can take the values of the administrative units 
and convert that into pixels. So take the population within an administrative unit or the population that meets a particular set of characteristics and distribute that to the pixels within a unit. And we can do that with the tabulated microdata as well. So the uh, paper that will be posted for discussion on Thursday kind of goes through the current state of IPMS Terra, the data that we have, the transformations and the operations that we are doing currently, and then lays out some of the possible future directions for IPMS Terra. And so what one of the things that I'm looking for through this cyber seminar is some feedback on which of those future direction, directions people might be most interested in or find most valuable. So I look forward to hearing your feedback on Thursday. Thank you. So David, I think you will need to present this part. David, <laughs> I think you're on mute. Let me unmute you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I, I don't want to um, I don't want to mischaracterize Ryan Engstrom's work or the, or the work of his team. Um, we'll we'll look forward to reading the the position paper that they've prepared for the week. Um, essentially. Um, that their aim is to is is in a, a sort of a direction of research that we call poverty mapping, um, and so um, as they'll explain in their in their in their paper, um, one of the, the key questions uh, for um, human mapping human population are converting um, nationally representative data, census data to um, gridded data, like we've seen in the in the. IPMS data presentation and, and the world pop presentation um, is that there are uh, populations who are traditionally hard to to um, to map. These are informal settlements, people who've been overlooked in, in censuses and other nationally representative data sets. And so um, poverty mapping is one approach to, to assess populations that might uh, otherwise be overlooked. And there are a variety of ways of doing this. Um, most commonly is the use of nighttime lights, uh, where where we see lights appearing in um, uh, in, in places where we didn't expect them. Um, so I, I really don't I don't want to get into the, the details of of, um, of Ryan's talk there. It is quite technical the paper, and um, but I maybe this is just a preview of things to come. I mean they do they do apply some really interesting machine learning approaches to um, disaggregation of of, of data. Or sorry, sorry, um, population data to to pixels. So, um, stay tuned is is what I is how I think I should reflect these these um, these comments, and then we'll pass it on to Catherine Grace. Um, so, Catherine's unable to join us as well, and I'll just very briefly go to the next slide if you could, David, um, summarize her presentation uh, in part to make up time. Um, but um, one of the main issues in health research has been the fact that um, a lot of data from the field, uh, particularly from the demographic and health surveys or the living standard measurement surveys, in order to protect confidentiality, they've displaced uh, their um, uh, coordinates of the clusters um, by uh, up to 10 kilometers away from where the people are actually living um, for obvious reasons. But um, one issue can be, you know, then linking that to what's going on in the environment can be made more challenging. Um, what remote sensing data can do is provide uh, environmental context around where people live and work. And I know that Catherine's work has been in the, in the West African Sahel, looking at use of remote uh, Landsat data and other things on agricultural uh, cropping, NDVI, which is greenness measures, and other things to look at how they in interact and affect child uh, mortality in, in villages in those areas. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
They can also be used to identify areas of vulnerability or concern, such as flood-prone areas. So this is an example of a, a cluster point in DHS survey with a 10 uh, plus or minus 10 kilometer kind of buffer around it, meaning the, the village could be located anywhere or the, the huts or the houses could be located anywhere in that 10 kilometer area. Then you have grid cells that might reflect precipitation. But within those grid cells, you also have remote sensing data, Landsat, maybe a 30 meter that can provide NDVI or greenness measures that can be used directly with the inf information that she has collected from the ground on uh, child mortality or um, you know, adverse pregnancy outcomes or um, maternal health issues uh, directly to the environmental conditions in that area. So this is just meant to illustrate that. If you can go to the next slide, please. And I believe it's over to Guido if you want to unmute yourself, Guido. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So if you can go to the... Um, so um, I'm here with uh, Caroline Hulquist. Uh, we are from uh, Penn State University and um, our contribution is about using citizens as indispensable sensors during disasters. Uh, next slide, please. So we discuss um, how the world has changed in the last 20 years, you know, very profound uh, changes as far as disasters are uh, concerned. So we start reflecting how the population has changed dramatically and uh, this did not happen uniformly. Uh, population increase are primarily along the coast, and those are the areas that are most dangerous from um, a hazard point of view. At the very same time, <coughs> sorry, we also analyze an increase of disasters. For the most part, we're talking about hydrometeorological disasters. So this combination of more people living in dangerous areas and more disasters occurring in the same areas has led to a drastic amount of disasters, and this is the figure that you see on the right. So we really have completely different new words. So the people um, really became a crowd, and what we mean is that people are most connected and have in human history. And also, while um, originally we were trying to monitor individual activities, right now we're really trying to model entire groups of people. And then the pixel became finer because we have higher resolution sensors, both in space and um, in the air and on the ground. Also, we have a lot more sensors, and this is what we mean faster. So the data feed rate is um, much uh, quicker. And finally, let's not forget that 20 years ago, the Internet was really just starting. So we had tremendous technological advances that led us to be more connected. So, um, and this is the point that we were making before, uh, but also um, the fact that we have high-speed networks, computing devices, ubiquitous computing and storage that allowed for a tremendous amount of new data being collected and analyzed on the flight during disasters. Next slide, please. We focus primarily about how citizens have changed. Instead of just being receivers of instructions or information um, and generally considered as a liability, um, they have become able to generate and share opportunistic data um, in order to study events, but normally this is studied after a disaster. And we really see a future of being able to actively use um, citizens as sensors to be able to share and respond to information um, that they're um, submitting online or through other sort of web-based interfaces. Um, and seeing them as an asset to be able to manage and mitigate these hazards. Um, this, these new opportunities is like, s instead of looking at it just as citizens as sensors, like in the framework of Good Child, I'm looking at citizens as essential sensors during emergencies as a low cost and high resolution source of information. And in a way that's pairing the digital earth to the physical earth um, to respond to these disasters. 
if you have any questions, we would love to take them. Um, so this is David Rathbal again, um, and I'll be reflecting a little bit on um, Jamin Vandenhoek's contribution, um, the study of war uh, and fundamental insights on human conflict um, using remote sensing and, and, um, and local, locally derived data. So um, the, Jamin's essential hypothesis is that war is a land use. Um, and that if we think of it from a remote sensing point of view um, and think about land use change over time, uh, we can gain some insight on what was a completely black box and unobservable process of, of um, uh, war, how it begins, why it persists, and how it ends, and its effect on the, the environment. Um, so the framing of war as a land use really um, enables us to, to ask these these deeper questions, and so some of the some of the characteristics of of war that um, exhibit themselves on the landscape um, are are patterns of of uh, so he, he's grouped this into three different hypotheses: the war as conservation hypothesis that war promotes a certain type of of um, ecological change, forest regeneration or expansion, for example. Um, that it can be detected as development in reverse. So whereas development is a process of, of um, agricultural intensification and urban expansion, that war can, um, the patterns in the landscape associated with war can include agricultural abandonment and the destruction of building and other infrastructure. Um, the other patterns that become evident in, during conflict are concentrations of conflict around um, resource extraction sites such as uh, mines or oil fields and this can be examined using the tools of remote sensing. Um, so again the, the, the key questions about why uh, war begins, why it persists and why it ends and the relationship of conflict to the environment are looming questions for the coming century especially as we consider um, the role of climate change in affecting uh, the stability of, of, of social groups that would be um, vulnerable. Um, so this this sort of approach allows us to investigate war in a in a and open this black box in ways that were never uh, previously possible. Um, so again, just this reflecting Jamin's position paper, but he'll um, um, he provides much more detail, um, and we'll we'll examine that as the week continues. So I think we have Beth here. Um, I got an email from her <laughs> just yeah, a moment ago. Here. Okay, there she is. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so my work and my position paper really focuses on, um, I think, a new realization and maybe um, new access to data that allows us to study informal and illicit economies in ways that um, were previously very difficult, both for data and epistemological reasons. Um, people in Pixels focus on households um, and, and kind of human behavior and land use decision making at that scale. <clears throat> and um, that progress was incredible. But it doesn't really work well with the scale at which illicit economies operate <clears throat> uh, because the drivers are really at the landscape scale and not produced by an aggregation of household patterns. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, I'm just getting over cold. Um, and so my position paper really focuses on the need to understand <coughs> uh, landscape patterns in order to relate it to illicit economies beyond just household dynamics and a call to really go beyond socializing the pixel or pixelizing the social to understand kind of these new new movements and economies. Uh, next slide. <coughs> <coughs> um, and the example that we give of this um, through a research team that I work with is understanding new patterns in deforestation and relating them to the illicit economy of cocaine um, in Central America. Um, and so 
um, researchers in Honduras noticed this new deforestation pattern, large, rapid clearings that seemed to be emerging at the same time that narco trafficking was increasing and expanding um, throughout Honduras. <clears throat> and so our research team took that initial hypothesis and we used the Hansen deforestation data set, which measures forest loss at a 30 meter scale annually um, over time. And we were able to extract pattern metrics from that. So we could identify individual patches of deforestation and measure how rapidly they were cleared and how unusual that pattern was from the rest of the deforestation pattern in that country. So we used a cluster algorithm to find those statistical anomalies in deforestation, uh, large deforestation patterns that was hypothesized um, by the, um, the other geographers in Honduras to be related to narco trafficking. Now I want to emphasize here that it's not because cocaine is being grown in Central America, but rather it's because of the large amounts of capital that are moving through Central America as a transit zone. Uh, need, that money needs to be laundered and cleaned in some way. And one of the best ways to do that in Central America is through land and through cattle. And so the movement of drugs was actually causing these rapid patterns of deforestation um, in remote and, and protected forest areas of Central America. So by extracting pattern metrics and correlating it to drug data, we were able to find statistically significant relationships with the emergence of those patterns. Um, and we found that 15 to 30 percent of this anomalous deforestation pattern in Central America <coughs> was responsible for forest loss. So really is a considerable <coughs> um, a new driver of land change um, that previously um, has, has been unrecognized or really has been looked at as proximate drivers of other researchers have recognized increases in human population growth and cattle ranching and building road networks as traditional drivers of land use change. But by zooming out and focusing on the pattern and the process of deforestation, we were able to connect that these proximate drivers of, say, cattle ranching were actually related to inflows of capital um, from cocaine. So I really think that, um, and this is what my position paper argues, that this example of tying um, illicit economy flows to landscape change um, is a new frontier that needs to be explored um, in land system science and will require much closer ties than had previously occurred between political ecologists and the social sciences that are that are really required to understand the mechanisms by which illicit capital would induce a land change. Um, and of course, um, remote sensing specialists and quantitative analysts to be able to actually turn those social hypotheses into pattern metrics um, and test those on the landscape. So we, we really provide just one example of that, um, but I think this field is, is starting to grow. And with the new data available from the Panama Papers and other um, so sources of data on illicit economies, um, I think we are in a new era of being able to understand and make visible what has previously been an invisible driver of landscape change. Thanks. So Doug, are, are you able to unmute your mic? I can do it on this end if you like. Um, hey. There you go. We hear you loud and clear. So go ahead and remember we're we're actually drawing towards the end of the, the webinar. I think we were a little over ambitious. So if you can be uh, brief in your comments, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, I'll do my best. So in a, just a few minutes here, we'll touch upon some um, some I guess cultural dynamics that have um, been. Uh, highlighted by the analysis of satellite um, uh, imagery. And um, the first, we're, I'll talk about two examples. If, and can we go to the next slide? If you can hear me. Yeah. So this is a pretty simple, but it was a very interesting uh, application of uh, NDVI 
So this, the backstory here is that um, we're looking at a, uh, the, the uh, population or the cultural um, uh, distribution of, of sites within the kingdom of Nabatea. Uh, and this is a, they, the Nabataeans were a group that uh, gained a great deal of wealth by moving precious commodities across the Arabian Peninsula from the south to the north. And for hundreds of years before the time of Christ, they had a, they, they essentially had a monopoly on the movement of things like incense, spices, gold, pearls, and silk. Um, they, they, um, they, they protected this monopoly by deploying a navy, an actual navy in the Red Sea, because the Red Sea would have been an alternate corridor for moving these uh, precious commodities to the north, to the Mediterranean, and then to the uh, cities and, um, and, and states that ring the Mediterranean, uh, Greece and Rome among them, uh, where, where they found the market for these, uh, for these commodities. So this went on for several hundred years. They amassed a great deal of wealth, but they were completely nomadic, and this was part of their strategy. As long as they remained nomadic, they could retreat into the empty quarter, and only they knew where the, the sources of water were. So, for example, um, in the uh, fourth century BC, one of Alexander the Great's uh, generals attacked the Valley of Petra uh, and found nobody there. They had they had just been nomads. They had just loaded their their precious commodities and and taken refuge in the in the in the empty quarter um, and what what um, what was left with just a few bars of silver uh, so that was that was in the centuries just before the time of Christ what happened uh, in about 66 BC is that uh, Pompey uh, went into the Mediterranean pretty much cleaned the uh, the the pirates out of the Mediterranean, that made the Mediterranean into a uh, into essentially a Roman lake, uh, and when that was done, they began to expand the Roman Empire to the east, uh, and eventually they annexed um, they, they annexed Nabatea, um, but even before then, they were taking control of the trade routes. Well, that left the Nabataeans without a real economic base, so they compensated for that by doing what they had uh, had been anathema to them up until that time, which was to engage in agriculture. Um, in, the, in the centuries before the time of Christ, this was actually illegal uh, to the Nabataeans. The, uh, building houses, engaging in agriculture were actually punishable by death. But uh, when the source of uh, income from the trade and precious commodities was taken away from them, they embraced uh, agriculture very, very enthusiastically because they were they were marketing uh, grain and olives and, uh, and and wine made from grapes to the Romans who were establishing their fortifications uh, along the eastern uh, eastern edge of the Roman Empire. So um, all of these dots that you see. Um, the red dots are Nabataean temples, the blue dots are the agricultural terraces, and none of these were in existence before the first and second centuries AD. And again, they suddenly appear on this landscape because the Nabataeans were relying upon agriculture to compensate from the wealth that they had gained uh, before from uh, trade. So the next slide, if we go to the next slide, another quick example. Um, is from the Southern Channel Islands, just off the coast of, of Southern California. Um, in this slide, we can see uh, these red dots are, are uh, archaeological sites of a certain type. They're actually ritual archaeological sites, and typically these ritual sites um, were, uh, this, they were circular uh, in form. In the middle, we had a, a hard-packed clay dance floor, and around the edges of these uh, dance floors, there were pits, um, sacrificial pits. And uh, among the uh, sacrifices in the pits were eagles and foxes. So this is this this generated very uh, rich organic soil, which we can pick up here just looking at uh, false color infrared or NDVI. So you see those sites. Next slide, please. 
these are the ritual sites. And um, yeah, this is um, perhaps a little bit difficult to see. Um, but over to the right, um, you can see these pink areas on uh, Santa Catalina Island, what, what is uh, labeled two harbors, and then uh, to the south of that is San Clemente Island, the Limitec. Both of those areas were places where they, uh, that contained these major ritual sites. Um, that, and historically, um, they, um, they were sites that, uh, where this certain kind of a ritual called Chignikhnish was, uh, was performed. Um, at that point in time, the Gabrielinos who had occupied the Southern Channel Islands, which you see on the left, uh, on, the, on the panel on the left, they had occupied those four Channel Islands, plus the Palos Verdes Peninsula, where, where uh, uh, Los Angeles is currently located. Um, they were in decline uh, because of, um, you know, well, there were conflicts with other uh, Native Americans moving in from uh, the north who were exploiting the, the, uh, the sea mammals, com competing with them. Um, so the... Uh, the, the simultaneous performance of these rituals on Santa Catalina and San Clemente Island was a way to enhance the social cohesion that was absolutely necessary for the the, uh, the uh, economic and social uh, well-being of this group of people. Let's go to the next slide. The, these, by the way, these um, these view sheds were generated. Uh, from synthetic capture radar data that were collected from an airborne platform. So uh, on the one hand, we identified the locations of sites on these islands using both multispectral and synthetic aperture radar, but we generated the few sheds, which were very, very important in understanding the social cohesion of this group. Uh, and also the, um, the ways in which the view shed uh, was, was essential to um, one important aspect of their economic life, which was the harvesting of sea mammals. So the way this works is um, it requires constant surveillance of the, of the oceanscape. And when you see pods of sea mammals, which could be dolphins or they could be sea lions, um, it's important to be able to deploy people in canoes who drive them into coves and there are other people that are placed into in those coves when the when the sea mammals are driven into the coves and they're dispatched. And this was a very very important uh, source of, of food because uh, sea mammals provide a lot, uh, many more calories than do fish, for example. But also the raw materials that they use for uh, making boats and tools and that sort of thing. So. Um, this is just uh, an example of the sort of perspective that uh, aerial and satellite remote sensing uh, provides us. It's a synoptic perfect, uh, perspective, perspective that uh, really almost demands that you think about the distribution of where people lived and what they were doing in terms of how they interacted with, uh, with their environment. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, Christoph, if you can unmute, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you briefly before we sort of wrap up the cyber seminar. If there are uh, high-level questions that panelists, uh, that I'm sorry, that uh, participants would like to ask uh, or of individuals on the panel, I'm sure some of them can stay on, and we officially have this channel until 1.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so we could go a bit longer if need be, but uh, I know some of you may need to leave. So, Christoph, please take it away. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'll keep it as brief as possible. Um, so I was asked to discuss developments in the space domain and associated implications for population environment research, and that's that's what I tried to, to do in these couple of slides. So I represent the European Space Agency at the World Bank, um, but yeah, I don't need to give any introduction. Please, next slide. Um, so following all the other seminar contributions and the various application domains that were highlighted in the past hour, I will now focus more on the evolution and revolution of remote sensing over these last 20 years since people and pixels 
and and try to maybe provide a, a glimpse of where we are headed in that space uh, domain. Uh, I'll, I'll strictly focus on the civil space. I just want to highlight that because obviously, obviously, there is a lot of things going on in the mili military that that contribute to a lot of the technological advances. But I, I will not highlight these. Um, uh, maybe you can still click two more times to to fully load that slide. Um, so uh, back 20 years ago, uh, there were you know it, it was really very much in its early stages the, the combination of social science and, and and remote sensing, and part of the reason was was certainly data availability. So just the the era of of commercially publicly accessible very high resolution satellite imagery it, it just started around that time with the Iconos project of of at that time space imaging um, you know first data became available in January uh, 2000 and this really kicked off a massive evolution and exploitation of that kind of imagery but still for a long period um, the, the the government owned and operated sensor like the you know well-established Landsat program that dates back to the 70s uh, and maybe some others at that time, the newer European ERS program. So, so those still provided that the main um, source of input for analytics in the, in the social science um, um, domain. Um, at the background you see the DMSP uh, satellite, uh, uh, one image of the DM of DMSP program that really raised a lot of um, you know, uh, attention and, and was used to, to showcase that, that integration of satellite data into, um, you know, questions about population distribution and so on. Um, maybe you could uh, switch to the next slide. So looking back one, uh, you know, uh, those, those two decades and even one decade, discussions were still very much constrained by the, the space-time um, issue of, of Earth observation systems. So the trade-off between a possible spatial and temporal resolution. So you either had to go for very high-res spatial or for a, a you know, more frequent um, uh, revisit time. Uh, but it was really from an application perspective it was driven that that the need for speed is crucial in many applications especially this came out of the disaster management field um, and and that's what kind of um, initiated the concept of uh, distributed systems and, and so-called constellations and the first ones were the first ones were the UK well it was the disaster monitoring constellation initiative led by UK's Surrey satellite technology uh, became operational in the mid-2000s uh, mid with five microsats uh, and obviously this has now, you know, uh, has, has really uh, caught up a lot of speed over the last um, maybe let's say five years. You can uh, keep pushing one more. Uh, so now Planet Labs operates more than 100 doves uh, in orbit, uh, picturing the, the Earth, you know, every day at a three to five meter resolution and there are a lot of other actors entering that field and and that's that's really um that the current the current state of the art and where, where we are headed in that regard for example satellogic just recently launched um a satellite their ambitious goal is by 2020 to have 300 satellites uh, in orbit as a constellation there's earth eye um you know and uh, these are in the optical domain satellogic hyperspectral ice eye operates in in a radar domain so there's a lot of developments in that regard uh, uh, with with small sets that are cheaper um, uh, to, to build and operate and yeah this kind of constellations really drive the, the developments uh, at the moment uh, maybe you could push uh, again to the next slide so it, it looks like that you know the private sector kind of outpaced the intergovernmental programs but uh, that's that's it, it has changed drastically with the with the European Copernicus program. So what you see here in this animation is uh, a Sentinel uh, Sentinel two constellation of twin satellites that now actually uh, monitor the Earth uh, and and take pictures uh, of the entire globe every five days at 10 meter resolution. So. While obviously other constellations provide, you know, um, more frequent uh, acquisitions, all of the Copernicus data is open and free. So this is a, a, a big difference to the commercial sector. 
Also, it has an insured data, um, you know, an, an insured timeline of 2030 and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I try to speed up a little bit here. So obviously, what you see here is that you know all these constellations. Um, the, the main goal was really, or the main focus shift was from higher and higher spatial resolution to higher and higher temporal resolution while still trying to keep the, the high spatial resolution. But still, no matter how dense the constellation or, you know, how many satellites you have, images always remain snapshots. So, next slide, please. So, we can spin this forward and actually in in uh, the first the first satellite that uh, managed to to take HD video was uh, by Skybox. Um, now, I mean later acquired by Google, then renamed into Terabella, then incorporated into Planet Labs and so on. But uh, what you see here is really uh, a image uh, a video, sorry, video from space. So both from a satellite and from the International Space Station. So this kind of spins that concept of um, combining very high-res spatial and frequent acquisitions forward. Uh, and uh, to wrap up, maybe next slide, which is my last slide. So given that constant striving for better, faster, more frequent and so on in, in this new era, uh, the, the latest developments now focus on real, you know, real-time Earth observation monitoring and the so-called uh, high-altitude pseudo-satellites that that um, are aiming at overcoming that that constraint. So they are in the in the stratosphere, um, much lower than satellites, but above the commercial air traffic, and they can really now provide um, you know constant, continuous um, monitoring capabilities that could really lead to you know basically monitoring of of, of population movements and and of you know, uh, open up new applications in the social science domain. And I obviously did not focus now in my presentation on anything on analytics, but on, this, on, the, on the space assets. But uh, in terms of analytics, uh, for example, European Space Agency's urban thematic exploitation platform now already starts demonstrating such novel applications, um, you know, using or simulating, uh, the, the, you know, these kind of data sets coming from high altitude platforms. So we are moving into that domain, uh, and if you push a last time, the, obviously the ultimate goal is integration of space-based sensors uh, and dynamic sensor networks that we have on the ground. Uh, regarding big data, um, the, the concept will certainly need to be revisited because what, what was big a few days ago <laughs> even is not big anymore nowadays. Just as an example, the Copernicus Sentinels collect currently around 14 terabytes per day. Um, so we're obviously running into you know, data issues also on that side. Um, there are downlink problems. You cannot link more data down uh, than you know, to a certain level. And uh, so analytics will even move to the platform. So onboard processing will become interesting uh, and eventual integration with, with real-time dynamic sensors on the ground. So uh, that's my contribution. Happy to answer any questions then in the um, cyber seminar. All right, this is David. Um, can you hear me? Let's see. Yes, sure. Try. Okay, David here. Um, can you um, thanks so much to all the presenters for a compelling and I think um, really nicely integrated um, set of, of comments. Um, really uh, looking forward to the, the papers as they as they come out during the week and the discussion that follows and accompanies them. Um, so as uh, I've been monitoring questions, or I should say question. Um, there's there's really there's really one um, for and it's from it's it's uh, among the panel so um, I'll go ahead and reflect that it's um, it's from Doug to Guido it says the graph showing frequency of disasters very striking we'd love to see data sources I'm sure we're going to have some um, some data um, <laughs> some uh, data geeking um, over the course of the of the week and I'm looking forward to that so this is kind of the in that spirit the first of, of um, questions about data. Um, and, and maybe Guido can respond to the, the source of, the, of that data set on frequency of disasters.
I think Guido may have dropped off, but it's likely to have been from MDAT. Um, so that's the likely source. Um, I don't see other comments or questions in the chat box. So I think what we can do is uh, call this to a close. I believe it was a very successful webinar. Uh, along with David, uh, I want to just thank all the panelists for excellent presentations. And there's a lot of richness in their statements as well. So those of you who are online now, uh, please do subscribe. And we'll be posting Emilio Moran's statement actually right after this. And uh, we'll be continuing to uh, post uh, almost daily one or two statements uh, to stimulate discussion. So thank you all for participating. David, did you have any last remarks you wanted to make? No, just again, sincere thanks to, to the, the panelists and to the uh, participants, the uh, members of PERN who tuned in today. Um, and I'm looking forward to an exciting set of discussions over the course of the coming week. Okay, thanks everybody. And this officially ends the, the webinar.